thankful for that. And our offering in the Sunday school this morning was one thousand and forty dollars. In worship service last Sunday, we had seventy-seven. I think that's been about the highest we've had in quite a while. So we're thankful for that. And at this time, we'll get started with our worship service, and we'll turn number four hundred six. Number four hundred six. <clears throat> Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray, and holy man of will be showered all around. Brethren, see poor sinners round you slumbering on the brink of woe. Death is coming, hell is moving, can you bear to let them go? See our fathers and our mother and our children sinking down. Brethren, pray and holy man of will be showered all around. Sisters, will you join and help us close this sister aid in him? Will you help the trembly mourners who are struggling hard with sin? Tell them all about the Savior. Tell them that he will be found. Sisters, pray and holy man will be showered all around. Number seventy eight, number seventy eight. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. We'll travel third. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my call. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the King in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and gives me song to the night. Redeemed. Redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Now number 97, number 97. On 
short on stormy banks I stand and cast a wistful love to Canaan fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. All o'er those winding stiffened plains shines one eternal day. There God the sun forever rains and scatters night away. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. When shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see my father's face and in his bosom rest? I am bound for the promised land, I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me, I am bound for the promised land. <coughs> of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, heavens are your tabernacle, glory to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy. Holy universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy Lord of heaven. Lord of Lord of heaven and earth, 
Ask our ushers to go ahead and make their way forward. I'm going to ask you if you would, if you would stand. We're going to continue in uh, worship, uh, giving of the tithe, of our tithes and offerings. And Brother Ronnie, would you ask God's blessing over this offering, please? Amen. You may be seated. I want to invite you to uh, turn with me in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, uh, beginning in verse 37 is where we're going to be looking at. You know, um, have you ever met someone who wasn't known for their tears? They didn't cry a whole lot. Uh, maybe you had one of those dads um, that, you know, his tears were very few. And, uh, but when he did cry, it was very profound. When he did weep, there was a, a great statement that, that had been building up no doubt for decades sometimes. And here we're seeing, we're going to look in the scripture here, there's only three recordings that we have of Jesus where he just weeps. And we know those, uh, you know them uh, pretty well. One would be that of the, uh, remember when he was uh, going to see Lazarus? That was the, those were tears of sympathy. Okay? He knew what he was going to do. Okay? There was no question about what he was going to do. They were tears of sympathy for the people who were there beside him. And you have the tears there in the Garden of Gethsemane where he's about to offer himself as the sacrifice, the Lamb of God that was, that was to be slain for the, 
for mankind. And those were the tears of agony. But if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. But this one, this one is of a very profound significance. We are looking at Jesus. We've been talking about him coming to Jerusalem since Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. If you don't know how long ago that was, that was about a year ago. So we've been going through Luke's Gospel, and it's been building to this very moment. It's been building to this moment, and, and there's this great procession that we're going to look at. But this is something that moves Christ to tears, and we're going to examine what moved him to tears in this, in this passage. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. Look with me there. It's in verse, beginning in verse 37. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. But then there was those sticks in the mud, those Pharisees, from among the multitude who said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said to them, I tell you, that if these were to hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it, saying, If you had known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to your peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. It says in verse 43, For the day shall come, for the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and they shall lay see, uh, and the, and they shall lay thee even to the ground your children within you and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation pray together. Father, we come before you. And just as we sang earlier, Holy Spirit, except you come down. All that we do is in vain. Lord, there's no amount of words, there's no amount of wisdom of speech that can, that can persuade the hearts of men to trust in you. This is something only your Spirit does. And Lord, if it takes me just getting, Lord, I just get out of the way and let your Spirit minister to us. Have freedom work in our hearts today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so Jesus is facing his this final week. Everything has been built up to this very moment. This week, in fact, when you look in your scriptures, there's more uh, recorded about this week, during this week, than the rest of the new, uh, than the rest of the Gospels. So there is a lot that is being put into this week, and this is the week that's leading up to his crucifixion. He has been, he is coming to Jerusalem and uh, I, I, if you've ever seen uh, those pictures, uh, they show the picture of the Temple Mount right there from the Mount of Olives. You can kind of just see that procession leading into that eastern gate and, and, and them just singing and shouting at the top of their lungs. And, and they're coming down that hill. But then in the midst of that, he pauses. And there he is moved to tears. In verse 38, they were saying with a loud voice, they were saying, Blessed is the King. This was the Messiah. This is the one that they've been hoping for that comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And he tells them, and then he had these Pharisees, these religious elites, these people that, that they thought they knew better. So said, you need, to re, you need to correct your disciples because they're saying you're, you're the king, the Messiah. Notice what he says there. He says, if I were to tell them to hush, rocks would cry out. They would break into the chorus. They may be singing the verse, but they'd be singing the chorus. That's how uh, important this moment was. He was the Messiah. He, and that's what he was saying. He, was, he didn't correct the Pharisees in that, uh, to, that okay, I'll, I'll tell them that, that they, need to, they need to tone it down a little bit. No, he said, if they were to hush, the rocks would cry out. That's how, uh, that's what he was saying. I am that, what they say that I am. I am that Messiah that has been promised to come. The noise of that throng and the commotion in the midst of it, there is a pause. 
there is a pause in his ascent. Now, you say, well, I thought he was going down the hill. Whenever you speak about Jerusalem, whenever you speak about the Temple Mount, it is lower in elevation. But you never say, I'm going down to Jerusalem. I'm going down to the Temple. You always say, I'm ascending up to Jerusalem. I am going to, uh, to that Temple Mount. So when it says that, don't get confused on that. He says, in that, uh, in that ascent, and you can just see, he stops and he pauses. He's just, he's weeping here. And maybe, you know, people would say, maybe he's weeping because of the emotional, uh, the, the, uh, the things that are being coming to pass. The kingdom is supposed to come. Maybe he's weeping over those things. But here, Jesus gives a very profound explanation. He says, because they did not understand the time of the visitation. Twice it says, if they had known. And today I want you to know, that's what I would have you, you to ponder on this too. If you had known that the opportunity laid before you today, if you had known these things, he wept at Lazarus' tomb. He wept in the Garden of Gethsemane. But here he weeps. And there are three reasons that Jesus tells us why he is weeping here. And the very first thing I want you to see, if you take notes, they're there in the back of your bulletin. Jesus wept because of their superficial religion. They had a form of godliness, but they had denied the power thereof. They, uh, uh, the Ecclesiastes says here that there's a time, you, you've heard it before, there's a time to weep. There's a time to laugh or to rejoice. And it seems if you were to look at what Jesus is doing here, it's out of picture. It's out of it's not, it says, Jesus, what you're doing here is not lining up with the circumstance. This isn't a time of weeping. This should be a time of rejoicing. But when you understand the explanation of what he's giving here, there is only one, there is only one valid response to this. And it would move any one of us, I pray, to tears. He shows here that Jesus wept because of their superficial religion. Uh, look at verse 37. When he was come nigh, even now to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. So why would that move him to tears? Because the very same people that were saying, praise him, praise him, hail him, hail him, king of kings, would be saying, nail him, nail him, crucify him. Not even a week later. It was superficial. They were looking for an external king, but there was no internal they hadn't put him king of kings of their hearts. They hadn't received what he had come to do. It was all superficial. Jesus, upon entering the temple, and we see this happening in verse 45. We'll be looking at that next week more uh, when Jesus cleans house. Uh, we're looking here, and he went in and he ca to the temple, and he began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought. And Jesus was... Uh, Jesus was riding into Jerusalem the week of the Passover. Now, what was the Passover? That was where they would offer up a lamb for the sins of the nation. And uh, that remember, it, you remember in Old Testament, Moses, they, they had that Passover lamb. So what? That the death angel or the angel of death would pass over them. If he saw the blood on the door, he would pass over them. And this, had, this was a foreshadowing of Christ and how the, his death would cause a... Hey, would cause us that the death angels could pass over you, that death would not be able to hold you. He would give you life, eternal life, and this was a foreshadowing of that. And Jesus Christ, he's coming in, they're saying, King of kings! And, he, and at this time, they would have chosen that Passover lamb. They would have uh, they would say, this is the lamb that's going to suffer and die. And Jesus Christ is coming in, and he says, I am that fulfillment. Every Passover lamb from that, from the time they began to that very moment was pointing to Christ. And he was to be the pick. He was to be the fulfillment. There was not to be any other sacrifice after him. He would be the fulfillment of all of it. But they were looking for something else. They were looking for something else. And all this week, to them, this was a religious ceremony. And Jesus here weeps over their religious ignorance. Yeah, some say ignorance is bliss, but here we see it's very dangerous. And Matthew chapter 7, we see that those that hold to that superficial religion, he says, many will say unto me, and I, I hate that, that word many. That's a scary word. It doesn't just say a few. It doesn't just say some. It says many in that day. 
will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? And in thy name have we not done many, not just a few, many wonderful works? But Jesus will, will have said to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Who are you? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Notice that word, work iniquity. He didn't say that their work was useless. He said that it was far worse than that. He said it was iniquity. Why was it? Because they were going to use that to prop themselves up, say, this is why you should let me into heaven, while the rest of my sin still lays bare and un, un, uh, uncovered. That's why it's iniquity. It's because they were putting faith in their works. Many would be putting their faith in their works. They're, did you notice here they're false praying? Lord, Lord. They pray. Did you notice here they're false preaching? Did we not prophesy in your name? Do you see their false power here? That they had cast out demons, their false performance, having done many wonderful works? Do you know what would cause Jesus to weep today? If he, if I believe it's the superficial religion in America. It's superficial. That form of godliness, but there's no power in it at all. It's time for the churches in America to wake up and to be aware of something, of the opportunity that has been laid before us. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And we need to turn away from religion and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. If your religion, I don't care what it is, I don't care if you put faith in your baptism, your church attendance, I don't care if you go to Sunday school, I don't care about any of those things. If it is in the place of a relationship with Christ, it is iniquity. Anything that comes between you and a relationship with God is sin, the scriptures point out. And it can be as simple as you putting faith in your own good works, your own good deeds. That's iniquity. It stands between you and a proper relationship with God. But we see here that Jesus weeps over that superficial religion. And if you take notes again, second point here, he weeps because of their passing opportunity. Now, this is one of those things, okay, I'm about to teach here, and I'm used to teaching with it this way. I'm going to teach it this way. Have you ever done something with your right hand? You know, you're used to doing things with your right hand. Those of you who are right-hand dominant, have you ever tried to do something with your left hand? Okay? If you broke your hand before, and you, had to chew, uh, you had to brush your teeth with your left hand, it doesn't work the same way, does it? All right, so be patient with me. I'm going to try to convey this. This may be too big for me to convey. Okay, I may fail in this, but I'm praying that the Spirit will help you and help me in this. Look at verse 41. And when they had come near, he beheld the city and he wept over it. And it says there that, saying, if you had known, if you had known, even you, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to your peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. For the day shall come when they're going to cast a trench about you. And they're gonna and they're gonna compass the ground and they're gonna keep you in on every side. That means no one's gonna get in, no one's gonna get out, no one's gonna escape. And he says that, and they shall lay you straight to the ground. There will not be even a stone laid upon the other. Your children are gonna be in there, and you're gonna be bereaved of your own children because you knew not. You should have known, but you knew not the time of your visitation. Now, what is Jesus referring to here as their day? Okay. You have to go back to Daniel's prophecy, Daniel's uh, 70 weeks, the 69th week. He says the 69th, there's 69th week, or 70 weeks determined for the nation of Israel. From the time of the decree that goes forth of rebuilding Jerusalem. Now, when was that? That would have been on, uh, on, on March 14, 445 B.C. by King Artaxerxes. From that very moment, that very day, he says there are 70 weeks determined. But 69 is going to tell, I mean, it's going to be up to the cutting off of the Messiah. And he's going to, he's, he, I encourage you to read that in another time. So from March, from that day, March 14, 445 B.C., when he says 70 weeks, he's talking about 490 years. But 69 weeks would put you at 483, right? Y'all follow me? And he's not talking about a 
a solar calendar. He's talking about a lunar calendar that is 360 days in a year. That would constitute the 173,880 days, which would take you to the very day of April 6, 32 AD, when Jesus would present himself. This was the day. I foretold it. I told you this was the day. You should have seen this. Had you had known this was your day. The, the day that was appointed for your peace. But now it's hid from your eyes. That is, you couldn't see it now if I pointed it to you. This is a very scary point right here. The opportunity that passes. It was exact. It was a precise fulfillment of this prophecy. And Jesus said, if you had known the things that were, that were belonging to your peace, but now this is, this is all hid from you. It was a day that they had missed. The Messiah, the Son of God, was there, and they missed it. There are instances that we see in Scripture of God providing opportunity, but people would disregard it. You know, we think about Noah. We think of Noah, okay, he was a shipbuilder. No, he actually was a preacher. He just, he just minored in shipbuilding, okay? All right. And for 120 years, that door of grace stayed open. He says, get in the boat. The rain, the wrath of God is coming. Get in the boat. And you can hear it in the backdrop. Every nail that he drove into that ark was in the backdrop. In the foreground, you've seen the wrath of God that was coming. He says, get in the boat before it's too late. And I love what happens. You, you read the scriptures. They get, uh, the, the day came and the rain came. Noah and his family got in the ark. Who closed the door? God closed the door. He was the one that sealed his shut. There was an opportunity that God had laid out for him for 120 years. And the only people that listened was his own family. You think about other opportunities as well. We, uh, you think about Noah, obviously, but then we also have also, uh, we have this generation. Think about this generation. We have more literacy per capita than any time in all of history. That is, you can read if you don't know what literacy means. You can read. There's a Bible in every home. And if you don't have a Bible in your home, you have it on your smartphone. We have more accessibility to the Word of God. We have more charge given to us than any time in history. We have a great opportunity that is laid before us. And what's incredible here, it's not just the amount of opportunity that we have, but I believe the patience that God has given towards this nation. The Word of God is so accessible. And I'm amazed that, that God's wrath has not yet descended upon this country. You see, we here, this is where I want you to, this is where the rubber's going to hit the road. You have an opportunity here today. You have an obligation here. A response is required. Let me, t let me talk to you young folks just for a little while. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. He says, remember now. Not remember tomorrow, not remember later. He says, remember it now. Your creator in the days of your youth, while the evil days come not, for the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Let me give you a statistic. They, uh, they, they did a statistic, and they, they surveyed 10,000 people that went to church. And of that 10,000 people, only 8% professed faith in Christ after the age of 20. What does that mean? That 92% did it before they were 20. So listen to me, teenagers. Listen to me, young people. You have an opportunity right now. Okay? Don't say tomorrow. Don't say later. Uh, of that number... Before the age of 15, that's 50 percent. Half of the people that make a, a decision for Christ do so before the age of 15. Why is that? Why is that true, especially for church kids? Let me tell you why it's true. Because you brush up against the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Every time you're here and you hear the Word of God and you know you ought to do something, you brush up against it. And what happens when something keeps getting brushed up against the hand? It gets calloused. And the hearts of many grow callous because at the age, after the age of 20, you've said, I've heard this all my life! And 
therefore you've grown callous to the Word of God. There is a great opportunity. The Holy Spirit conviction. Let me tell you something about the Holy Spirit's conviction. It passes. It passes. Don't get the idea that you can get saved when you want. Scripture does not lend you that courtesy. You get saved when the Holy Spirit of God draws you to that salvation. The Scriptures also says, no, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. God speaking, My spirit will not always strive with man. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek you the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. What does that insinuate? To neglect. This is what I want. This is, you don't get anything else. I need you to hear this part. To neglect the Holy Spirit and what he is doing for you right now and trying to convince you of the things you ought to, ought to do. If you neglect it, you run the risk that he will cease to strive with you. God's Spirit is moving. And, and, and here in this service, and I pray it's not too late for you. You say, well, Brother Hayes, how can it be too late for me? You know what Jesus did? He said, you should have known. This was your day. This was your visitation. And what we're going to look at here in just a moment, if he looks down the corridor of time, 38 years from that time of their judgment. He says, now it's, it's, it's sure. You should have seen this day, but now that you haven't seen it, that judgment's now sure. You say, well, but they were still living? You mean there was no more opportunity? There was no more opportunity. You say, well, did they quit going to the temple? No, they went to the temple every day. There were still sacrifices being made. And that opportunity passed. And I tell you, this is why I'm saying this is left-handed for me. Used to, I would teach you that the mortality of man is God's final call. But I can tell you this, based on the authority of Scripture, your, your final call, God's, God's ceasing to strive with you could be 20 years before you die. You could go on 20 years, and you could come to church, and it could be completely oblivious to it, and, not, and it'd be hid from your eyes, and, and, and it'd just be completely blind to the understanding that you needed Christ. And why, what, is that, what is that thing that blinds? We know that the, the God of this world blinds the hearts of men. And you know what he's going to blind you with? Your superficial religion. To brush up against the Holy Spirit of God. And to continually say no to him. Eventually he stops striving with you. And this is the thing that, that scares me. Because as I pray for you guys every week, I begin to think, well, maybe, God, are you still moving in their lives? And there is, there is somebody in my prayer list, I will not disclose who, they don't go to this church, but God has told me to quit praying for them because their time has passed. That scares me. And I plead with God, don't let it be. But it could very well be. That, that I, I, I don't pretend to know. But what I do know is you have an opportunity Jesus here, he weeps over the city because of the opportunity that has passed. What a horrifying place to be. To be still alive. And God's Spirit not, not striving with you anymore. I've decided that that is a much more fearful reason, much more fearful reality. I could, teach, I could preach up here to you this morning that hell is hot. I could preach up here to you this morning. You know not what lies on tomorrow. For what shall, I mean, you don't know what a day shall bring. For what is your life? It's but a vapor that appears for a little while and then it's gone. I could preach both of those things to you. But there's something more fearful than both of them, I believe, combined, is that the Spirit of God would stop striving with you. Oswald Smith, he wrote a, an interesting article concerning Satan. They had a, they had a, uh, uh, a big gathering of, of demons, and they said, what can we do to damn the world? This is what we'll do. We'll, we'll tell them that God doesn't exist. We'll just say that God doesn't exist. No, the other demon said, no, that won't work. Because it's obvious that the things that are made are made by the things that are not seen. It's an obvious thing. You can't, you can't say that there's no God. Okay? So what we'll do here is we'll say he's, he's holy, he's righteous. He's a holy God, but he won't receive you. No, we know him to be a merciful God. And then one demon stood up and says, I've got it. We'll tell them that he is good. We'll 
tell them that he's merciful. We'll tell them he exists, but what we'll tell them is you've got plenty of time. And they rose up and said, that's it. Now listen to me on this. Jesus wept because of their superficial religion. He wept because of their passing opportunity. And then lastly, he weeps because of their smoldering judgment. Look at verse 43. He tells them, for the day shall come upon you that your enemy shall cast a trench round about you and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. And he says, And shall lay thee even to the ground, your children within you, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. You know, some historians put that the massacre that occurred in 70 A.D. was close to a million Jews. They said that the, they said that the blood ran down the streets like like rain falls, or whenever rain falls and there's a, a, you know, there's a downpour and it floods the streets. They said that's how thick the blood ran. And this judgment, it was sure now. It was, the, uh, they crucified the Jews till they ran out of trees. And Jesus coming down the Mount of Olives and on this cult, he's looking down at that city and he weeps because of their superficial religion, the passing Opportunity and their smoldering judgment. He looks down at the corridor of time and sees the trouble that's going to befall them because they had neglected that opportunity. I want to close with this thought. What is the nature of your heart towards the Word of God? Are you receptive to it? Are you sensitive to what the Spirit of God gives to you? Now, notice what I said there. I didn't ask you if you like my preaching. I didn't ask you, uh, if you if you like me or whatever. I ask you very plainly and simply, do you, do you have a sensitivity to the Spirit of God and His Word? Here's what I fear. Some of us in this room may have very well have deluded ourselves in religion. And you think that you're saved. You think that you've got it all together. And if you were to, I were to ask you, why, why should God let you into heaven? You would say almost verbatim what Matthew 7 did. Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not go to church? Did we not do all these wonderful things, these wonderful works in your name? See, you, you can't just repent just of sin, the bad things, okay? You've got to repent from your, even your good works, okay? Paul said this. He says, he remembered, do you remember when he listed up his credentials? He said this, he said, uh, I count all things. He says, I count all things but loss for the ecstasy of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may know him. Why was that? Because his credentials were getting in the way of the relationship he should be having with, his Jesus, with the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he have to do? He said, I had treated it like dung. What did he do? He flushed it. And maybe that's what you need to do is flush anything your own self-righteousness, you have to flush it so that you might be a recipient of His righteousness, His right standing. For Paul, in order for him to be saved, he had to flush his credentials. As we prepare for our invitation, I want to, I want to put up here one last verse for you. It's a warning. It's a warning for everyone. It doesn't matter if you've been saved, if you've been baptized. If you grow callous, if you push aside the Spirit of God, it says that he that being often reproved, he hardens his neck. He still, I mean, he hardens his neck. He, his, how, his heart grows callous. Then suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. And I, I have to end with this. I want to end with this. Is the Spirit of God convicting Say, don't think that you have all this opportunity. Don't think you can get saved when you want. If the Spirit of God is dwelling, is is is, is convicting you right now, this is all. This is the opportunity you've been lent. And I wonder if Jesus would, if you walked out this door, if he began to weep over you, saying, "You should have known. This was your opportunity. You should have known that this was the this was the time of your peace." But now it's hid from you. You won't be able to find it now. You may, you may say, I'll seek the Lord when I'm older, and it will be hid from your eyes, and it won't be there for you. Some of you need to be baptized. 
let me say something about that. I got to talk to a young lady this week of another faith. And when she, if she were to put her faith in Christ, that would be detrimental. But if she were to get baptized, that family would immediately ostracize her. And I'm not going to diminish you the opportunity to be baptized and, 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 and coddle you and say, oh, you know, it'll be okay. Let me tell you something. You need to identify with Christ. He that loves father, mother, son, daughter, he, anything, anyone, more than me, he, the Scripture says he is not worthy of me. He takes a precedent in every relationship. And let me tell you, let me tell you, if the Holy Spirit has convicted you on this, to make this initial step, and you continue to harden yourself to it, you will not come. And let me tell you, can I just kind of spell it out for you? When you get older, you'll begin to walk away, and you're like, why, did I, why am I walking away? Because you didn't know the time of your visitation. You didn't know that this, this hour was the time of your peace. And it's been given to you. It's been given an opportunity for you today. What's the consequence? He says that judgment will come. And that judgment, when it comes, it will come without remedy. Don't, don't, don't think that you have more opportunity. What if this was your last opportunity? What if this was it? You need to treat it like it is. And whatever the Spirit of God is telling you to do, this is why we have an invitation. And last at this time, if you would stand. And what the Spirit of God has lent to you, you need to you need to bring it forward. You need to follow through. Three sixty.